before that uh, presentation and all was started to tell them that they were HIV positive. And then a couple of them died. And he realized he had to write something in response. And that's when he began to work on risk. And Lava Lem became the perfect starting point because Lava Lem about consumption and artists living in Paris was so naturally transferred to AIDS and East Village and people living in New York in the 1990s. And that he had written this show in memory of his friend who had lost, and that he dedicated it to them. And that was the first time I heard any of that, and that is further stayed with me also. So it was a couple months later that we were near the beginning of our rehearsal process of the new production. And um, I hosted a birthday party for myself. My birthday was in October, which we were starting in December. And I invited Jonathan, and I was really happy that he showed up. He stayed a long time. And then we left. A friend of mine came up to me, and he's like, who was that guy? I was like, what, Jonathan? He said, yeah, what's with him? I'm like, what's me? He said, well, I asked him what he did for a living, and he said to me with a perfectly straight face, he said, I'm the future of musical theater. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, dude, totally. I mean, what is that about? <laughs> well, maybe he's right. Yeah, but still, does anyone want to admit that? <laughs> well, I guess he was a little bit right. But I also think that, you know, I can picture John as saying it, and I don't think, I really don't think he said it as, like, you, like, 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 some real cocky thing. I think he said it really, like, straightforward, which is kind of weird, too, in a way, but, I mean, I can't imagine myself saying something like that, but at the same time, I think he was just like, yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> but he, he was right, you know, and to, for him to say that, you know, like I said, he, he graduated from college, you know, at whatever age, 22, and he was now 35, or, yeah, 35. And he had had nothing happen for him beyond lots of encouragement from people saying, you're really talented. He'd had a couple, he'd won a couple grants, which is nice. But he had had no productions of anything he'd written that, that somebody else had given him. So he had continued to write and work at a diner all of those years, and he still had the confidence and the guts to say something like that. And he still had the confidence in himself and, and as an artist to write something as generous of spirit and as open-hearted and open-minded and uh, and visionary as Rent. So many people I think in this position would have withered and become embittered and become less of an artist in the face of all of that and, and Jonathan did. So, Finally, we were about to begin rehearsals, and the night before rehearsals began, John went home to what he called a peasant's feast at his apartment, a potluck dinner for the cast and crew. And this was, it turned out, it was a tradition that he and his friends would do for each other every Christmas time because many of them were uh, a little strapped for cash, and it was hard for them to go home. So they were the peasants, and they would feed each other at home. But this year, because rent was, it was the night before rehearsals began on December 19th, uh, he hosted us instead of his normal friends, which apparently caused some of his friends to be a little upset, but we didn't know that. But, um, but um, he, he gave us host before we all sat down for dinner. He was just like, you all are going to bring my friends to life, and I wanted to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for being my new friend. And to, you know, for all these years of working in showbiz, I've never met a writer who had been that uh, open and embracing and um, welcoming and inclusive to to us as he had been. So there were many, many, many things that were unusual and special about him personally and also the way he went about his work in my, in my experience. Then we go back into rehearsal. There were three of us who had remained from the 94 workshop to the off-Broadway production. And there were, so there were 12 new people. So the first day of rehearsal, we started once again with Seasons of Love. And it was like the three of us were working on this secret and watching the 12 other people discover the magic. Which was even more magical because it was, there were even better singers, even more right for the roles. Jonathan had written, you know, Jonathan made leaps all throughout the writing of this piece to make everything better. 
as evidenced by the lyrics that I shared with you earlier. <laughs> but like One Song Glory, for instance, has been, had been a song called Right Rain, which is a very different notion of like literally Rogers, like I gotta find my right brain, my creative side of my brain, which is very different than I gotta write one song before I'm gone. The stakes are a little higher than one thing. <laughs> so that was the route that Jonathan had made those kinds of leaps in his writing, which was in and of itself very inspiring. Um, and so rehearsals were going along really, really well. Everything was like even better, better, better all throughout. And one day we were getting close to uh, the final stages of our rehearsal process before we would open the door to the public. Um, Adam Pascal, the original Roger, and I were on stage just flocking to what you own. And we were literally singing the lyrics, We're Dying in America, the end of the millennium, which is, as you know, the end of their song, when there was this big commotion in the back of the theater. And and we sort of stopped, the production manager rushed to the stage. He's like, um, sorry, but it's obvious, but uh, Jonathan just fainted. But he's up again, and we're going to take him to the hospital. Just I'm sure he's all right. He's probably not fainting. So that was a little weird, but you know, he was probably also as excited as he was, it's also exhausting and stressful. He needed a good stretch to stretch. So, you know, we figured he probably needed to stay home a few days and just rest up. And there wasn't a whole lot that he could do at that point anyway, because we were getting to that point where we needed to just finish the work before we present it. You know, the way that these things go, we get it all done, what's written, and then we present it to an audience, and then from there we can really get a sense of what needs to be fixed. And John was so ready for that part of the process. So, you know, we fit him well, and we kept working, and um, a couple days later, finally, we made it through our tech process, and we were gonna have our first dress rehearsal. And uh, so the dress rehearsal in a professional setting is, um, I don't know what it's like in the school or other schools, but it's open to invited guests. But we like to pack the house, and it's with so it's with people who are generally knowledgeable and friendly, and but you know we'll be honest. Um, so it was a packed house of those kinds of people, and Jonathan was thankfully well enough to be there. He was still looking a little pale, but really excited. He was like rock and roll, <laughs> and uh, we did like. You know, the village boys happened to be there. Like, they sent a photographer, and we did a photo, little photo op with Jonathan on the set, and Jonathan and Michael, and all of us. And uh, then we did the dress rehearsal. And, you know, dress rehearsals are a little, they can be a little sloppy and a little wonky, but this was, this was just like on fire. The audience went bananas, as they tended to, wound up tending to do after that, or forever after. Uh, it was like, you know, there's this thing that can happen if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been on a stage when people are like screaming and cheering, but it's literally, it's, you know, sound has physical force and it's literally, you can feel it. That was happening all night long. It was quite incredible. So the way, I don't know if you ever saw the original production, but there was a door upstate center. And I was there because that's the door at the New York Theater Workshop and their upstate center wall that leads to the dressing room. So after the show, I came out of that door and I walked out and I was looking for Jonathan because I wanted to like talk to him and give him a hug. And, and, I, and I, he was standing like right in front of the stage over there and he was surrounded by people, like people clamoring to talk to him. And I could tell it wasn't just his friends, it was like a fan. And you know, when you come out, when you come out to the stage door, when especially the last few years, it's gotten pretty crazy on Broadway if you ever go to the stage door. You know, but they want to see the actors generally, right? They, but the, the fact that so many people had sought Jonathan out, that they wanted to find out who he was, and they wanted to go talk to him and thank him, was pretty special. So I, was, I had a lot of stuff that I wanted to say to him, because I had kind of like been saving up all the thanks that I wanted to give him, you know, for giving me this amazing opportunity to be a part of the show, giving me a chance to sing on stage again, for writing amazing queer characters that have been writing a show that had so much to say to so many people. It was such so fulfilling to perform. And also, you know, not to be too sappy, but for being my friend. So I kind of wanted to gush all that out of him, but he was surrounded by those people. So um, I went and talked to some of my friends who'd come who were all completely blown away, which was pretty exciting. And they again they were people who would have been honest with me, would have been like, they would have been like, no, it's good. <laughs> but they were like, my friend literally said, I have to stop talking about it because my head's going to explode. 
Um, so I talked to them and I looked back and John was gone. I was like, well, oh, where is he? Well, it turned out he was talking to a reporter from the New York Times who was so blown away that he asked John and for an on-the-spot interview. He wasn't a critic, he was just sent there because they thought it was interesting. There was this La Boheme, you know, adaptation running. It was the 100th anniversary of La Boheme, coincidentally. So they just sent him, he was a classical music writer. He wrote about opera. He wrote about symphony orchestra. But he had been so impressed by what he'd seen that he asked John Lennon for an on-the-spot interview. And for better or for worse, the New York Times has a lot of power in theater. So this was a very big deal that Jonathan, after all these years, was getting this chance to talk to the New York Times. So I thought, that's pretty great. So I waited around for a little while to still want to talk to Jonathan. But it was starting to get a little late. We were going to have to come in the next morning for rehearsal, because that's what you do with previews. You rehearse, change things, come back to the preview, rehearse, change things. You know. So I was like, OK, I'll go home. And I walked past the box office where he was talking to the reporter. He was completely into it, animated, locked in. And I even thought about knocking on the glass to wave goodnight, but I was like, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so I went home, went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, still so excited that I woke up before my alarm went off, which never happened. <laughs> so the adrenaline was still pumping. And I reached for my phone to check my voicemail because I thought, you know, maybe some of my friends that came last night left even better messages. <laughs> but the only message on my voicemail was from the theater's artistic director asking me to call him right away. And I thought, well, that's kind of like not very good. So what, what? Did someone get fired? What, what, what happened? Before I could call him back, the phone rang, and it was my agent, Sarah, who was the one who told me that Jonathan had died. And Jonathan had gone home that night after the dress rehearsal, and he had collapsed on his kitchen floor, and he had died. And yes, he had fainted the other night, and yes, he hadn't been feeling well, but there was no remote indication that he was anywhere within years of being dead. It was the most insane piece of information to come across that phone that I could ever have imagined. She, she worked with his agent, that's how she knew the news to tell me. It was um, crazy. At the same time, trying to make some sense of it, it was like, well, okay, well, he, uh, maybe he you know, wrote this stuff, he got it out of himself, and he, then when he was done, he died. Okay, well that makes sense, not at all. So we gathered at the theater, we were scheduled to have our first preview that night, but it seemed pretty clear pretty quickly that that, that wasn't appropriate to just sort of open the doors to the general public on, a, on this day, and it seemed like there had to be something to do to to mark the occasion somehow, but we didn't know what it was. Doing the show didn't quite seem right either. So we canceled the preview, but sort of were sitting together and you know, sort of mostly in silence, just sort of being with each other, not knowing how to respond. And then Michael, the director, took me aside. He's like, "Well, I think what we want to do is perform the show for his friends and family. His parents were flying in from Albuquerque." Can you imagine getting that phone call in the middle of the night? And, but he said, well, we, well, we don't want to worry about all the technical issues. We don't want to worry about the costume changes and running into things in the and blackouts and, you know, worrying about moving the chairs around. We just want it to be about the work and just, just that's what's most important tonight. And that made a lot of sense. So we, we were going to line up the table and just sit behind the tables and just sink to the score and have the theater be filled with Jonathan's incredible work. That made sense, and once we had that to rally around that infuse us all with this incredible urgency and energy. So we, we made our preparations, and then we, you know, we were li literally getting into our places, and the, the doors opened, and there was this wave of shock, disoriented people walking through that room, walking through the doors into the theater. The theater is probably about the size of this room, actually. And I was introduced, before the show began, I was introduced to Jonathan's parents, who were this very gentle, quiet, natured, completely lost, uh, wonderful people, who, you know, his father was just like, we have to come, we have to come. Like, 
there was no question that it would be generic. And we, we started the performance not knowing how we were going to do it or what it was going to be like at all. At the, and what happened pretty quickly was there's the show has such incredible force and energy here that that took over. And it took over the audience as well. This audience of people who were in grief were still able to laugh <laughs> uproariously at the comic moments. That, that, and then when Rent ended, the, there was such a jolt of electricity <laughs> there, they cheered. And then later in the act, when Adam sang One Song Glory, there was a hush like you've never heard. It was one song before I go, one song to leave behind. And we went through, and then, you know, when we got to La Vie Bolin, th there was so much energy, and here we were at these tables, and I just couldn't help it. I just had to get up on the table. There was like, there, I couldn't stop it. And I can't, you know, I couldn't have articulated it that night, but looking back all these years later, it, what the show itself, is, what's happening in the show itself is partly this, that there's this community of people who are up against these incredible odds that some of them are dying, or close to them, or facing poverty, facing all sorts of really tough situations. And at the same time, they're not forgetting about it, they're not shoving it into corner. They are including it, embracing it, and living fully into it. And that's what we all were doing that night. It wasn't forgetting that John, it wasn't forgetting the loss, it wasn't forgetting the sadness, it wasn't forgetting the pain, it was, that's part of life, and we are still able to live fully right now, and right now, and right now. And everybody got up on the table with me, and there was like, the, the cheers at the end of Act 1 were amazing. And we sort of all said that Act 2 is a lot simpler, and once we'd gotten up like that, we couldn't sort of go back to our seats. So Act 2 was going to be fully staged. And then Act Two, we you know starts out with Seasons of Love, and we took our places along the edge of the stage and looked right out at the audience. And some of them were holding tightly to one another, and I could see his parents. And it was like, how are we even going to get through this? We're singing about loss. We're singing about how do you measure your life? And here we are. Our friend and collaborator is gone. And you know, for those of you who are singers, you might know that to sing. It sort of requires a, an open throat. And if anybody in this room has ever cried, you might notice that your throat tends to close up when you cry. So that was starting to happen. But then at the same time, it was like we couldn't let that stop us. And so we just forced, it was like forcing our hearts up through our throats and out. And we made it through. And, you know, Jonathan, I, I can you know, never forget Jonathan's parents raising their hands over their heads. As, as we sang that song, as Gwen Stewart, our Seasons of Love solo, sang her incredible, beautiful solo that went up to the roof. You know, and I thought there's, like, I don't know about ghosts, I don't know about spirits, I don't know. The jury's out for me, could be, but it just seemed like, how could Jonathan not hear that? Somewhere, somehow. 